Good morning, Sheep Street. Are you with me? A couple of notices before we get into worship. Um, our lunch club, Lunch at One, which meets monthly, is, is due to meet this Wednesday, and they're a bit short of servers. If, you, if you're free on Wednesday and can come to help, it means it involves carrying trays and putting the plates in front of people and so on. Um, who asked me about that? Rachel, Rachel. Uh, either ask Rachel or you can ask me, af- me afterwards what, what it involves and what time to come. A uh, message from Wes. If any parents would like their children to come back in for communion, after the sermon, when we're singing a song, can you go and get your child and bring child or children and bring them back in, please? And Ian, you're going to say something. Mad dash from the back. Um, yeah, it's just a quick notice to say on, uh, on Saturday we have our film night. So um, do come along to that. It's at uh, 6.30 in here. And um, yeah, do, do please come along. We've got uh, the normal popcorn and uh, cake and biscuits and other goodies. So um, it'd be lovely to see you. And of course, there's some leaflets at the front. I say it's the front, it's cool, but the back, isn't it? Um, whichever way. Um, and, uh, and so take some of those and invite a friend, you know? It's a, it's a really lovely way of, um, of showing, showing other people that we are normal. We're, <laughs> we're normally, okay, well, <laughs> um, normal-ish. And uh, anyway, it's a, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to, uh, a little bit of outreach, really. Um, Connected with that, um, it would be really great if we had a few people, after we've had our teas and coffees at the end, the tables in there, in the hall, need to come up back in here. And because we'll be setting out for the cafe church next week, as a, which is related to the film, and we have the tables out here for the film, it would be great if we could have a few people helping out moving chairs and setting up, the, setting up the tables later this morning. Does that make sense? Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. We've come together to worship our God. Let's begin with prayer. Forgive us, Lord, that at times we're so rooted to the earth and able to see beyond the present and blind to your presence with us. As we come together today to bring you our worship, help us to put aside all that's happening now so that we can focus on all that you have in store for us in the present and in the future. May we put aside what is temporary and short-lived and make time and space now to focus on what is eternal and full of your love. Let us lift our heads so we may see Jesus in all his glory and all things in their true perspective. We come to meet you, to hear your will for us, and to leave this place ready to be all you call us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together, if you can, and sing holy, holy, holy.
number of children is quite depleted today, but they're still going to be very happy to go away and leave us, aren't you? Let's pray for the children as they go out. Father God, we pray for all the children you call into this family here. We pray for those who are away on holiday, that you'll bless them and enrich them this morning. And we pray for those here, that they will continue to learn and to grow, to know more about you. We ask that you bless them by your Holy Spirit as they go to their classes now. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father, Sovereign God, thank you for your amazing grace, abundant favour and unconditional love for us. Thank you that you are a good, good Father. You go before us and make our crooked path straight. You place a hedge of protection around us. You make a way where there is no way. You make all things work together for our good. Thank you, Father, that we can draw from your unending reservoir of strength, wisdom, favour and shalom peace. Thank you, Lord, that you bless us to be a blessing. Lord, keep our hearts soft and open as we go about our day. Let us hear your voice. Help us to hear what you hear, see what you see, and feel what you feel. Help us to see you in the world around us. Thank you, Father, that you never remember our sins or hold them against us. Help us also to forgive those who sin against us. Hold us and guide us through all our pain. Thank you, Lord, that your precious Son, our Lord Jesus, paid the price for all of our transgressions and that by his stripes we are healed. As we go about our busy lives, being your hands and feet, helping and supporting those around us, help us to remember to be like Mary and take time each day to sit at your feet, Lord. We ask that your Holy Spirit will be with us, that you will guide us, and protect us, giving us your shalom peace in all we do. In the wonderful, perfect name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Let's join together again in song to our Lord, my Jesus, my Saviour. Lord, there is none like you. Thank you. 
mountains bow down and the seas roar at the sound of So our reading today is Acts 4.32, uh, 5 to 11, a, uh, a particularly challenging verses, number of verses for Wes this morning, I think. So, I thought I was going to be able to read that from there, but I'm not. <laughs> Go to me piece of paper. And me glasses. All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. Now a man named Ananias together with his wife, Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. With his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you receive for the land. Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not lied just to human beings, but to God. When Ananias heard this, he fell down and died, and great fear seized all who heard what had happened. Then some young men came forward, wrapped up his body, and carried him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, tell me, is this the price you and Ananias got for the land? Yes, she said, that is the price. Peter said to her, how could you conspire to test the spirit of the Lord? Listen, the feet of the men who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out also. At that time, she fell down at his feet and died. Then the young men came in and, finding her dead, carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear seized the whole church and all who had heard about these events. Well, Wes, there's a challenge. <laughs> Let's pray for him as he comes to unpack this passage for us. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that sometimes it's full of joy and encouragement and light, and sometimes it's a real challenge 
Please open our hearts and our spirits this morning to hear what you have to say to us through Wes. We pray that he will be filled with your spirit and he will speak to us the words you've given him just as we need them today. Amen. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Here we go. We can do this, guys. We can do this. Let's look at some people here. Uh, Recognise these two? Yeah, Harry Potter. Brave. Neglected. Natural talent. And then you've got Draco Malfoy on your, yeah, on your right. Uh, cowardly. Spoil. Buys himself onto the Quidditch team, if you know the stories. Well, these, these guys you might know. Dr. Jackal, Mr. Hyde. Dr. Jackal uh, is kind, isn't he? And he's dignified and he's respectable. And Mr. Hyde is he's a bit of a psychopath, isn't he? He's violent, he's ruthless, he's a thug. We've got these two here. Oh, what a film. Toy Story. Love it. You've got Woody. He's kind of cautious and he doesn't like change. He's resistant to change and he's hesitant. And then you've got Buzz Lightyear, who's kind of new. And um, he's deluded, isn't he, at the end of the day? And he's impulsive. And in literature, literature, it's called a foil. It's when you have two characters which are very, very different, or sometimes just different in one way, and it kind of heightens the other person. And in today's, we've got Barnabas, and then we've got Anna, Anna, I to say word, Ananias and Sapphira. And at first glance, there doesn't seem to be much difference between the two of them. Because Barnabas sells a field and he gives the money to the apostles and then the apostles give out the money, don't they, to uh, the poor. Ananias and Sapphira, they sell a property, so similar-ish. They keep some of the money, they pretend to give all the money, give it to apostles, and it doesn't end well for them, does it? See, for Barnabas... He understands that great grace means, you know, you give a lot, your great generosity. And he plays a pivotal role later in the book of Acts. We'll hear quite a bit about Barnabas. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira drop dead and we never hear of them again. That's the end of the story for them. And we're going to walk through this text, okay? We're going to walk through it. But let's be honest what Pam's already said and Ian sort of hinted at. It is a deeply problematic troubling text. If it's not, I don't think you're quite getting it, because Luke wants us to feel unease about this text. It is a tricky, tricky text. So we're going to walk through it, but I think, when I first went through this earlier in the week, I thought, well, what questions does this raise for me? Because maybe it raises for me similar questions it raises for you. I mean, did God actually kill them, or are we reading this wrong, is my first question. And if so, why did God kill them for lying, and yet we're all still here now. Does God still do this? That's the trickiest question, I reckon. Uh, were Ananias and Sapphira even followers? Because some people would claim they weren't even followers of Christ. That's a problem here. Um, what's the right response to this text? And I think the biggie at the end for me is, uh, how on earth does this text help me tomorrow? On Monday, when you guys are in your context of normal life, what, how on earth does this text actually help you with that? So I'm going to try and hit those questions. And you can tell me over coffee later, later whether I fudged it or not. But we'll see. That's what I'm going to try and do. The opening scene lulls us into a full sense of security. Let's see the film buffs. Who thinks they're a film buff here? Loves films. Ian, come on. <laughs> Just Ian, right? We're going to test Ian or anyone else. I'm going to show you these are all opening scenes of films, okay? Here's the first one. What an amazing film. Anybody want to shout out what the film is? Ooh, it's a really famous film. Yes. 70 years old and still a brilliant film. It starts that really, um, it looks a really dull start. Somebody sat there, they broke their leg, they're convalescing, and you think, where in the, in earth is this film going to go? Because it starts so slow. Right, one to James so far. Ian, come on. Right, here comes the next one. Are you ready? What film? Yeah, Up, and actually, you get up. Up, what a film. Has anyone watched the first few minutes of Up and not cried? I mean, it's an awful beginning. So you've got this lovely couple, and it starts... You don't like it? 
You never heard of it? Okay. Chris was doing that the whole way through, like, don't approve of that film. Um, <laughs> up starts this lovely little cat, people here, and it follows them through the decades, and it doesn't end well. And it, I have to kind of look away or try and avoid watching it. But it starts, that's the opening scene, it looks lovely. Uh, what about this film? I love this film. Bonus prize if you get this one. Anybody know the opening, what that film that is? That's tricky. It starts with a mum running to her son, giving a lovely hug. There's a beautiful, back st a beautiful kind of scenery, etc. And you think it's all going to go well. And the film ends with exactly the same scene. And you realise, oh, there's more to it. If you ever want to watch a brilliant sci-fi film, Arrival is fantastic. That's my little film tips for you there, OK? Uh, all those films start with a nice beginning. Okay? And it kind of lulls you into what's coming. And this is part of what's happening here. Because Luke is putting it on thick. He says, all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed any possessions of their own. There was great power. There was grace. There was no needy people. And we get this Barnabas as a wonderful example. Okay? So he's setting the scene. I think the chapter's wrong. I don't think the chapter heading um, should be put at chapter 5. Remember, chapters were written centuries later, not part of the Bible. I think it's in the wrong place. I think this is the start. And he's setting us up for what's going to happen. And we've got this kind of early church in Jerusalem. And they've got a shared fellowship of love and generosity and care. Isn't that what we want, guys? Isn't that lovely? And that's uh, so what we're trying to emulate. But let's not get dewy-eyed. Because Luke is saying us what's going to happen in the next few chapters. Okay? So we get today a whole pile of deceit. But later on, we're going to get greed in the church. Surely not. And then we're going to get, brace yourself, friction in the church. Who's ever heard of that before? But that's going to come later as well. And Luke is setting us up for a shock. Just like those films, he's saying, isn't this great? And then he's going to give us a dose of reality of what happens from that. And they shared everything they had. I've heard people argue before that's some form of like, um, early socialism, etc. That doesn't make sense, okay? Because later on, Peter clearly says in the passage Ian read to us that Ananias and Sapphira's sin is not because they didn't share everything. Okay? When Luke says here they sacrificially shared, what it means is there were no needs in the church community. Not wants, no needs. In other words, the believers held their stuff lightly. I love that expression. Hold your stuff lightly. Be ready to give it away as required. We should rightly be challenged by that. Hold your stuff lightly. And the key verses are here, these two. All the believers were one in heart and mind. And because of that, and also before that, God's grace was powerfully at work. They're so sold out for Jesus and each other, their radical generosity just naturally happens. It just happens. It's not like they're grudgingly doing it. They focus on Jesus, and one of the outpourings of that is, when you see a need, you respond, if you're able to. And Jerusalem was a city of extremes. I don't know if you've ever been to Jerusalem. Um, then and now, extravagant wealth and terrible poverty. I don't know if you ever know where Jerusalem is. If you, you know, I went there last year. And it's bizarre where it's located. It's not located where it is because it was on a fertile plain. Okay? There is no fertile plain. It's on the top of a kind of a mountaintop in the middle of a desert. It's in a daft place where it is when you see it. It's not there because it's an important, important trading route. It's not on any trading routes. It's not there because there's lots of water there, to where normally cities. There's no water particularly there. It was located where it was for religious reasons. And because of its remoteness, goods were really expensive. It was pricey to live there, so it was rife for people on the margins, beggars, widows, prostitutes. <laughs> Don't you ever thought about devisers? I was thinking this the other day. Devisers, where it is, it's a bit daft where devisers is. How can I say that? Devisers, where it is, because the Bishop of Salisbury in 1080 wanted to build a castle. And he had to build it where he did here, because we're on the margins, aren't we, of the, um, the manors of Roud, Bishop Canning, and Potton. That's why we're here, okay? Because <laughs> he couldn't build it anywhere else, so he sneaked it in the middle. Crafty thing to do. And we're a town of extremes, aren't we, people? Let's be rightly challenged by that. We're a town of extremes. 
And then we get to the example of Barnabas. I like Barnabas. He's one of my favorite characters in the Bible. He's an encourager. He's really happy to play second fiddle to Paul, which sometimes must be a bit tricky, let's be honest. And he's faithful. I really like him. Ten chapters time, we're going to read probably about six months time. There's a huge row between Paul and Barnabas. And if I was if I, looking back at it, I think Barnabas might be in the right of the two. I might be wrong on that, but I think he might be in the right. But anyway, here he sells the field and he gives the money to the apostles and then the money is going to be distributed to people who are poor. And all of that is like an introduction. It's not the main part, that is an introduction to what comes next. And it's a bit of a shock, isn't it? Because it's a bit more Old Testament than New Testament. I mean, if, it doesn't, if you don't go, ouch, when you read it, you know, read it again. Now, first of all, Luke lays us on thick. Sapphira is in on the act, okay? He really t- makes that really clear. So she is in on the act as well, the pair of a minute. He says, okay, now a man named Ananias, together with his wife Sapphira, also sold a piece of property. If you didn't get it, Luke now says it again. With his wife's full knowledge, so they're both complicit in this, okay, he's laying it on thick, they kept some of the money for themselves and they, brought, and they put the rest to, at the apostles' feet. This is sometimes called nowadays virtue signaling. Have you ever come across that virtue signaling, the phrase? It's an attempt at very conspicuously showing how great you are, but the reality is a bit different. Here's an example of virtue signaling. <gasps> Innocent drinks, I quite like them, okay? So I'm not having a pop at them, okay? There's loads of ones that you could have mentioned. This was an advert, one of many, which got them in really hot, hot water recently. Um, they went on and on about their green credentials, uh, and they did a huge advertising campaign. Uh, the problem is they're owned by Coca-Cola, who are one of the biggest pollutants of plastic in the world, and they got a huge kind of pushback for this virtual signaling. If you put greenwashing in the internet, you get loads of companies. That was just the one I quite like the advert of, okay? So I'm not having a pop at them. There was a famous actor recently. Uh, she said, I think it was last year, that um, she wanted to be arrested for her environmental activism by the time she was 60. And then the next day, she was caught drinking champagne on a first-class transatlantic flight. And I'm not having a pop at her either, because we all do it. Always point the finger at ourselves. We all do it, often without realising it. How do we do it? We slip. We slip into the conversation something we've recently done to make us look good. Have we ever done that before? You chuck it in. And sometimes I suspect we don't even realise we're doing it. We say a little something to say, look, we're good. We're doing lots of stuff. And we forget that actually people, we're here, to, we're here for an audience of one. We're here to please King Jesus not the people around us. And here, Ananias and Sapphira, they go for it. They've seen Barnabas do it, so they think it's our turn. Let's sell the property, we'll give some money to the apostles, but, and it's the important part, we'll make out it's all the money. And the word in the Greek here translated, the kept, is often used for stole in the Bible. You could put it for, they stole it. Not that they didn't have to give all the money, but if you're going to pretend, if you're going to say you're giving all the money, give all the money. Why such a big deal? Right. Well, it reveals their heart, doesn't it? They, They don't care about the poor, let's be honest. They don't care about Peter. They don't care about the church. They want to look good. That's what this is about. And Peter explains it really clear, clearly. Oops. Here's what Peter says. He goes, didn't the money, didn't it belong to you before it was sold? Yeah, it was theirs in that way. And after it sold, wasn't it your money? Yeah, they could have gone and bought another property if they'd wanted to. So the failure was never that they retained some of the money. Like, please bear that in mind. The problem is they lied about it. If they had said to Peter, we've sold a property and here's some of the money, it wouldn't even made it into our Bible, I don't think, the story. But then Peter drops a bombshell, because who did they lie to? They haven't sinned or lied against the church, or the people, or the apostles, primarily. He says who it is. He says, you didn't just lie to humans, you've lied to God. 
And this now opens up the whole theological framework. Because look what Peter says before that. He says, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you've lied to the Holy Spirit? We read this as them lying to Peter. But underneath that, there's a whole spiritual battle going on behind it. A clash between Satan and the Holy Spirit. Do you see? There's a whole depth behind this. And when we knowingly and repeatedly sin, do we ever consider who we're ultimately um, sinning against? And we see this time and time again in Scripture. I could put whole power verses up, but I won't. We are sinning against people. There is a corporate element of sin, without a doubt. But ultimately, we're rebelling against God. And people will never take sin as seriously as God does because he's perfect and we're not and we will riddle out of it and we'll justify it and we'll excuse it and we'll compromise it and we'll try and bend scriptures and do anything we can but God doesn't. He takes sin really seriously. And when we see this passage through God's eyes as much as we're able, it no longer seems as harsh because they've lied to the Holy Spirit. And we say, but it's just a lie. This is complete overkill. And it would be if it was just them lying to Peter. You'd be like, come on. But they've lied against the Holy Spirit. And I sometimes think perhaps a better question would be, why doesn't God strike us down every time we lie or virtue signal? Thank God for grace. <laughs> Could you hold on to that during a sermon? It's a hard passage. Could you hold on to grace? Because... We've all virtue signaled, and we've all lied, and we've all exaggerated to make ourselves feel better. And we've all lied about not doing it as well, I suspect. Thank God for grace. There's no way to sugar this pill. So just, I'm just going to say it. Put your, put your seatbelts on. Here you go. The UK church as a whole is appalling, in my opinion, at taking sin seriously. I would go as far to say it's the underlying reason why some denominations aren't going to exist by the time I'm an old man. We have so much to learn from our brothers and sisters in the global south. There's your walk through. You're looking quite glum. Give me a smile. There's your walk through. Let's, let's hit the questions, okay? Did God actually kill them? If so, why did God kill us for lying? Does he still do this? We're leaving followers. What's our response? And what on earth do I do this passage tomorrow? Let's hit the first one. Did God actually kill them? Um, I listened to a well-known church leader on YouTube not so long ago, and they were desperately trying to worm out of this one. They were, they were, they were, do, they, they were trying every stunt. It was a bit painful to watch. Um, I don't think you can get this one down to natural causes. Okay, you could perhaps argue that Ananias is so shocked by being called out by Peter and maybe he had furry arteries and he drops dead. Maybe. Okay, because if you read the passage, you might be able to read it that way. But when at Sapphira lies, Peter says, the people, you know, the, pe- the young men outside who just took you, um, buried your husband are waiting for you. And then at that moment, she fell down and died. God does it. And that might be problematic for us, but I can't wriggle out Sapphira if I can on Ananias, which I'm not convinced I can either. So why did he kill him for lying? Well, partly as they lied against the Holy Spirit, so they'd look good. But I think a better question is, why doesn't God not do that to us when we lie? I think that's probably a better question when we virtue signal, when we look better on a Sunday than we do on a Monday? And that's a trickier question, and I'm going to go a little bit into speculation, so hold this bit lightly, okay, guys? Because I'm going to go a little bit... Sometimes I'll say things with conviction, and sometimes I'll go, "Mm, I think this. I think verse 11 is massive in this. This is where Luke bookends the story. It's almost like, here's the moral, guys. Here's the moral at the end. And he says, great fear seized the whole church and all who heard about these events. I think it's dead easy to gloss over that verse. But that's his end. That's really where the chapter should end, I'd argue. That's what he says at the end. 
That's his conclusion. Now, for believers, not for non-believers, for believers, fear in the Bible means reverence. It doesn't mean fear as in, I don't know, someone hiding under your bed at night like I used to worry when I was a child. This is about reverence. Yes, God is our friend. Yes, Jesus is our older brother, which are amazing promises. And yet we need to hold a, retent, hold a kind of attention that God is sovereign, that he is in charge. And we hold those two in tension. And out of this event, the believers in the church had great reverence for God. And those outside the church knew what God was capable of. And the context here is that the church is newly established. Just starting in Jerusalem. It needs to be on a good footing. And this terrible event seems to purify the church, which is a hard message. And also establish the, the apostles' authority. Because if Peter had fallen for the lie, who would have, it would have come out in the end, wouldn't it? What would Peter look like? So I take this as a specific, necessary event at this point in the Jerusalem church. But that does directly lead into that question then. Does God still do this? Yeah. Now, I've said, I've said many times, like, I really want to be a Jesus community that doesn't shy away from the tough questions. But I'll be honest, when I sat there earlier in the week looking at this one, I thought I'd like to just boot this one down the, down the road. Because this is a tough question. <laughs> I really wanted to beat this one, but I knew someone would pick me up on it if I did. Well, could God still do this? Yes. I think that's an easier question first. Let's do the easy one first. I think he could. Of course he could. He's sovereign. When we lie, when we virtue signal, we're doing that against the Holy Spirit. We're doing it against him. But clearly, we don't normally drop dead because I'm looking at whole congregation today and I'm here as well. So that doesn't happen. Thank goodness for God's mercy. Mercy is different from grace. Yeah? Grace is when we get stuff good we don't deserve. Mercy is when we don't get the bad stuff we deserve. Thank God for his mercy. I've heard stories of this sort of thing happening. I don't know how substantiated they are. It's a wormhole if you start going down that line. But as so often, I find C.S. Lewis handy. C.S. Lewis said, Aslan, the lion, signifying Jesus, is not a tame lion. Pinter, the theologian, says, we do not worship or follow a tame God whose ways are predicted, whose ways can be predicted or can, can be controlled by our prayers. Have you ever tried to control God by your prayers? It doesn't work like that. We would do well to remember that. And here's what I do know. I know God hates sin. And there will be a reckoning. There will 100% be a reckoning but maybe sometimes people get a reckoning earlier. And this is where I leave this question, which some of you go, oh, he hasn't quite answered it. And I think God might sometimes do it if you're really going to push me one way or the other. But hold the tension. Hold the tension of Hebrews 4.15 that says, for we do not have a high priest who's unable to emphasize with our, with our, with our weaknesses, but we have one who is tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. I love those verses. And hold attention to Jesus speaking in Revelation 2.5 when he says, If you do not repent, I will come and remove the lampstand from its place. Hold the tension between the two. You don't solve it by removing one of them. Were they Christ followers... Well, ultimately, only God knows human hearts, doesn't he? It's not for us to go around saying who's in and who's out. But I can see no reason in this passage to say they weren't Jesus' followers. So if you follow Jesus, that's tricky. The story, the context of the story, Luke says is, he says, this is the action of all the believers, which seems to drum bows into them as well. They knew the Holy Spirit, it says in verse 3. You know, we can be followers of Jesus and yet be led into repetitive, deliberate sin. And that's sobering. And ultimately, there will be a judgment. God disciplines those he loves. It's sobering, that is. That's really sobering. 
I think sometimes of those Jesus followers who are suddenly caught in an affair and it comes out in the open. And actually, that might be God's grace, letting that come out in the open. It's a sobering thought. What's our right response to this passage? I think that's the easiest question. Because <laughs> verse 11 says, great reverence for God. Let us live carefully, people. The word is um, circumspectly. You do something and you stop. and You go, is this good? Am I in God's will? Do another step. Get in the habit of quickly asking for forgiveness. Don't hold the stuff. If you've done wrong, catch a person as quick as you can. If you're brave, ask someone you trust, do I virtue signal? Do I chuck in things just to look good? I'm going to become really clean with you, okay? I do it. I caught myself this week doing it. I was having a conversation with someone, I had to drop in something I did. And I thought, why did you drop that in? You're preaching about this on Sunday. Catch yourself, people. And then my favorite question. How does this text help you tomorrow? And I'm hoping you feel uncomfortable with the text, because I think Luke would be disappointed if you sit there going, I love this text, it's great. Yeah? That's not the idea of the text, okay? It's not that passage. Two people have died at the end of this. But how can I use this text to inform what I do tomorrow? I, I think there's loads of answers, but I've boiled it down to two. Here you go. If there's nothing you remember, remember these two. Live generously, live authentically. Hold those two. If everything else goes out the window, bear those two. Generous. The Bible talks about being sacrificially generous. Some people get so, I've talked about this before, some people get so caught up on tithes, the 10% tithe. Ooh, it's like a, like a wood chime. Um, some people are so loaded that 10% would mean nothing. It wouldn't mean anything to them. They could give away 50% and they wouldn't notice. And for some people, it would be crippling then to give 10% away. Being generous looks different for other people. How do I back that up? This passage, which is a parallel passage from Mark. Jesus sat down opposite the place where the offerings were put and watched a crowd putting the money into the temple treasury. Many rich people threw in large amounts, but a poor widow came and put in two very small copper coins worth only a few pence. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, truly, every time Jesus says truly, by the way, it means here's something surprising, don't try and worm out of it. Okay, truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put more in the treasury than all the others. They all gave out of her wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. Live sacrificially generous. When you give, it should hurt. Not the cream of the top which you don't notice. And it will look different for other people. I would move away from a 10% tithe in the New Testament. And then second of all, ruthlessly eliminate hypocrisy in your life. And we all have it. And I am preaching to myself, Hirsch and Hirsch write, how easy it is for lies and false motives and lack of accountability to get hidden under a veneer of spirituality. Can't we do that as Jesus followers? People, we can't manipulate God. I have to remind myself that. We do not worship an abstract God, some smoke in the sky, etc. We worship a God who makes covenants with us. If you want a great book on it, catch me afterwards. The Secret Place of Thunder had a real, really recommend this book about this. The author Stark says, the most important things in life are done in secret. Your times with God, your giving, your fasting, your good works as much as you're able, aren't to inflate your ego and make you look special. You've got an audience of one. Who's the person who's going to judge you? It won't be me. It won't be anyone else. It'll be Jesus. That's your audience. And we need to do this intentionally because our hearts have a natural propensity, don't they, to trumpet themselves. And in closing, who do we look towards? Look to Jesus, of course. We've got to finish with Jesus. How was Jesus sacrificially generous? Well, he came down to earth, for starters. He emptied himself. And he died a death on the cross, which we talked about last week in the resurrection. 
And he says to us, come and follow me in my sacrificial life, my generous life. And how was he authentic? Because his words completely matched his actions, didn't they? He was the real deal. No one could ever charge Jesus with hypocrisy. What he said, he did. And as we walk in his steps, may we do that. Let us be a people who are outrageously generous and completely authentic. Tough passage, isn't there? Tough passage. But when you put it like that, thank goodness this is in the Bible. Thank goodness this is in that there are consequences for how we live our life. Maybe in this life, certainly the next. Let us be generous people and let's be authentic. No one wants hypocritical Christians. Certainly not the world out there. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, this is, <laughs> this is such a tricky passage. And uh, we read it and we feel uncomfy. Especially, you know, in, in the culture we're in. That this just seems so harsh. And, but we thank you it's there, Lord. We thank you that all scripture is God-breathed. And it's there for our help. And I pray that we will take this seriously, Lord. If we are people that sometimes lean too much in the grace, let us remember the truth as well, Lord. In the same as if we lean too much in the truth, let's not forget the grace. And I pray for us both individually and as a church community, uh, help us to live generously. Help us to hold our stuff lightly, to be generous with our talents, be generous with our money, generous with our stuff, generous with our time, which is often the one we're not, probably not so generous with. And help us also, Lord, to be authentic. The world is rightly fed up of Jesus followers who say one thing and yet their lives just look the same as everyone else's. May we truly follow you, Jesus. May we act the same on a Monday as we do for our Sunday best. And Lord, we need your strength to do this because being generous and being authentic isn't part of our sinful natures. And yet, Holy Spirit, you live within us. And I pray for each one of us, show us where we can be generous. Show us where we are being hypocrites. May we point the finger at ourselves, not others. Teach us to start by ourselves. And I pray that we will be a church community that is outrageously generous and we walk the talk, even when it is deeply costly. We ask this all in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. We're going to go into a time of communion, um, but before that, we're going to sing King of Kings, please.
please be seated. The invitation we're going to read together. I'm going to read the uh, writing in black. And if you could read back to me the writing in white, that would be fantastic. Uh, the Father has made us a people. Jesus calls us together. And the Spirit binds us together. Look, here is the Lord's table. Spread as for a feast. Bread for breaking. Wine poured for drinking. Signs of his love and hospitality. Symbols of his life broken. His blood poured out. He is not dead. He is risen and present among us. Evidence of God's covenant grace and promise. So we come in faith to this table, you and I. We're companions on the journey, you and I. Some of us today are fresh and eager, and some of us are weary in need of nourishment. Some of us are feeling God's grace and love. Some of us are harboring sins and not feeling so great about ourselves. But we all need to be conscious of our failings. But remember, we serve a God who delights in forgiving us. So we're going to have a short moment of reflection, a time to examine yourselves. Where have we not loved God with our heart, soul, whole soul, whole soul, strength and mind? And where have we not loved our neighbour as ourself? Or to put it a different way, where have we not been generous? And where have we not been authentic? Let's look a moment of reflection. Let's read the confession together. Merciful God, we confess to you that we have sinned. We confess the sins that no one knows and the sins that everyone knows. The sins that are a burden to us and the sins that do not bother us because we have got used to them. Father, forgive us. Send your Holy Spirit to us to give us power, to live as you have called us to live, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Come now, don't hesitate. The feast is ready, and the Lord himself invites you. It is very easy, after a sermon like we've just done, to feel heaps of judgment. And it's good to feel reverence, and it's good to be convicted, but remember, sometimes we pick up things that Jesus has forgiven us for. We have to say, I am forgiven for that at the foot of the cross. Don't forget the grace and mercy, please, people. If you are sat there and you love Jesus, in amidst all the not-so-generous living and perhaps sometimes un unauthentic living, welcome to the family. You're not the only one. Come to the table. It is not me inviting you. It is not the leadership team. It is not Sheep Street not the BU or whatever, it is Jesus Christ inviting you to this table. If you are orientated towards Jesus, take the communion, please, people, where there's grace and community and love. I have asked two people to help. I can't remember one of them. <laughs> I do. <laughs> Thank you, lovely people. Chris, if you go there. So Jesus said, this is my body, broken for you. 
Do this in memory of me. When the bread comes round, it's gluten-free. Please take it. the same way after supper Jesus took the cup and said this cup is new covenant sealed with my blood whenever you drink it do so in memory of me when a wine comes round hold on to it and we take it together why do we take it together because we're one family there's no hierarchy do not ever put me on a pedestal I'm a sinful man we are equal and we're journeying together we take it as one family to support one another. Thank you. Thanks, Drink this and remember Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Heavenly Father, thank you for um, the incredible sacrifice of your son, Lord Jesus. We stand in awe of what Jesus did for us. Please give us the power and the strength to be generous, to be authentic, to be loving in our lives. Lord Jesus, we remember you're a friend, but we also remember you are king. Help us to strike the right balance in our lives and now. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's together just do our fi- um, say our final prayer after communion. Father God, we have been nourished and had our thirst quenched through bread broken and wine poured in thanksgiving for your Son, Jesus Christ. This week, may we be generous and authentic in all we do that we might show through word and deed that he is not dead, but risen and present among us. Hallelujah. Amen. Please stand for our final song, Your Name is Holy.
together in this way is coming to an end, but our lives go on. Let us live in truth and authenticity and commitment in the days to come. Let's close with prayer. Lord God, in gratitude for this time, for this meal, for these people here, we give ourselves to you again for the coming days. Take us out to live as changed people because we have shared the living bread and cannot remain the same. Ask much of us, enable much by us, and encourage many through us. Then, Lord, may we live to bring you glory, both as inhabitants of this earth and as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Amen. <coughs> Do stay and join with us in the hall for refreshments. Talk together as long as you can. <laughs>